Great to see you. It's great to be with you virtually. My name is Ben Eggleton. I'm here as Director of Sydney Nano, one of the university's flagship multidisciplinary institutes, and I'm really pleased to be introducing the session. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I'm on the Camperdown campus, uh, of course, which is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within this university, may we always pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So welcome everyone for this uh, very exciting uh, event, an online event. Unfortunately, uh, we had planned a hybrid, but I think we converged on uh, doing this online for obvious reasons. Um, this is the um, first fire side chat of 2022, and we're starting off with a rock star. Um, I'm really excited. Um, we are going to be recording this session, so just a note, um, and that will be used um, and put up on YouTube, I think, and shared with the rest of the world for their benefit. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Pigo Varamini, who is a lecturer in the um, a lecturer in pharmacy and pharmacology in the Sydney Pharmacy School, and has been and is deeply engaged with Sydney Nano uh, in a number of contexts, but in particular is co-chair for the Nano Pharma Cluster for the Nano Health Network. Um, Pega will be moderate, moderating this fireside chat. Um, Pega, over to you, and I look forward to this fantastic session. Thank you so much, Ben, for the introduction, and um, thank you, everyone, for attending this very exciting session. So it's my immense pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor Stephanie Watson um, to this very exciting and kind of first fireside chat at Sydney Nano. So before starting to introduce Stephanie, I would like to congratulate her for receiving recognition in the Queen's Birthday Honours 2020. Um, she was given the Medal of the Order of Australia in the General Division. That is a very, very prestigious um, achievement. Congratulations, Stephanie, on behalf of Sydney Nano and all, um, I'm sure, the um, attendants. Um, so um, Stephanie has been listed as the only Australian in ophthalmologist top 100 global power list for ophthalmology in 2021 and 2022, Professor Watson continues to gain recognition for her service to ophthalmology. Um, she's currently the head of the corneal unit at the Sydney Eye Hospital, Sydney Children's Hospital and Prince of Wales Hospital. She's co-founder of SafeSide um, Kurtakonas Registry established in 2014 and also the co-founder of Ransco's Women in Ophthalmology Group in 2018. Stephanie is uh, the current chairperson of Australian Vision Research, uh, formerly known as Ophthalm uh, Ophthalmic Research Institute of Australia. And um, she is a professor of, at the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the Safe Side Institute. Um, so without further ado, I would like to go into the um, main point of our discussion today, which is um, on the clinician scientists at work what do they do and how can they help you with your research translation? I think this is um, becoming more and more important, um, these types of conversations. And uh, despite having like um, there being a significant amount of funding invested on medical research, um, they have not produced corresponding increase in the new treatments and cures. So instead laboratories, um, laboratory discoveries just remain in what they have been termed valley of death. Mm -hmm. So that is the gap between bench um, research and clinical applications. Recently, there have been considerable discussions around this uh, topic in the literature and the scientific community. And uh, we are really going to uh, touch on this very important phenomena and we want to see how we can bridge this hole. So I think it's quite obvious for everyone um, that there is a very significant um, um, need for clinician scientists and that is universally recognized as being essential to progress medical research across what is regarded as value of death or translational gap. So today's discussion will be around um, how we can address these issues to improve clinical outcomes in Australia. So I would like to um, hand it over to Stephanie um, as she will um, bring us some uh, slides, I think, and um, giving some uh, introduction on this topic, and then we take it further to questions. 
Thank you very much for the kind words of um, introduction. So I have a little presentation that will just sum up uh, my sort of journey as a clinician scientist, um, and hopefully you'll find that useful and then we'll have a chat about it. Uh, so this presentation is called Fighting Corneal Blindness, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. Uh, and it's about my journey. So yesterday, originally, I did a Bachelor of Medical Science at the University of Sydney, and that was in neurology, and that really got me interested in research. I then completed my medical studies, and part of that, I had an option turn. I went to Oxford, where I studied neurology, and then I went to Kenya, where I did ophthalmology. And in Kenya, I discovered that there were patients with a really great need, you know, um, that there were so many people awaiting treatments and cures, and I did my first piece of research. I then met Fred Hollows, and he was at a book signing up the road from the university, and I said, Fred, look, I want to do um, ophthalmology, and he said to me, why the hell do you want to do that? Um, nonetheless, he signed the book, and, uh, and he was also a bit of an inspiration along my journey. So when I finished my um, medical studies, I decided I wanted to be an ophthalmologist. Um, I'd liked research from my university days, and um, I was quite interested in the cornea. Now, this is the eyes window. And blindness to the cornea is actually irreversible, and it affects all ages. Children that have blindness die um, have a much higher risk of dying um, within one year of becoming blind. And the cornea is such a problem that the WHO has ranked corneal scarring as a priority eye disease. So my next step on my journey was to do what we call a corneal fellowship after finishing my training in ophthalmology. So I went to Manchester for six months and worked under Andrew Tullow. Um, this is the view from my room in Manchester. And then I went to Moorfields Eye Hospital in London and worked with Professor John Dart. Um, and Moorfields is, is the greatest tertiary referral hospital in the UK for ophthalmology. And um, this is my first paper uh, that I got from working at Moorfields, and it looked at a surgical technique, and it, it provided clinicians with insight into, the which, uh, into one of the better ways to do corneal grafting. And it's since been one of my best cited papers. Now, this brings me forward to coming back to Australia after my fellowships, and um, then I became interested in trying to fix stem cell blindness. Now, if you think about the front of the eye, it's a bit like a garden. To have a healthy front of the eye, you need to have not just the seeds that grow the flower, but flowers, but also water and rain, to keep them healthy, a good soil. You need some protection from the sun at times. Now, on the front of the eye, we have these stem cells called limbal epithelial stem cells. And it's said that every seven to 10 days, these cells completely replace the cells on the front of the cornea. And they do this by dividing and producing a daughter cell that then moves across the cornea. So they're like the, the seeds of the garden and they're producing the flowers, which are the cells. But for many patients, their garden is a bit like my garden. There's lots of sort of dead and dying and unfortunately uncared for plants. And this condition can arise from a number of causes. And what happens when you don't have that replacement of stem cell or replacement of cells through your stem cells is you get corneal scarring. And uh, this image here is from a patient of mine who had a very severe injury with beer line, uh, from a beer line cleaner. So for beer to actually taste good, they clean the lines that deliver the beer with sodium hydroxide. And this is an alkaline chemical that causes um, catastrophic damage to the surface of the eye. So once you lose your stem cells, the conjunctiva grows over the front of the eye. And chemical injury is the most common cause, and it's typically in a young working age um, population, and we can't treat it with standard grafts. Now, so um, I met a scientist at the University of New South Wales um, who's now Professor Nick DiGirolamo, and we started talking about ways to try to um, repair the cornea when it's been damaged with, um, uh, from stem cell loss. And uh, he discovered that uh, on contact lenses um, that are removed from the eye, you can see epithelial cells, and that led to some studies examining whether contact lenses could actually support the growth of stem cells. And we then developed this into a clinical trial. 
and we had a 63% success rate. Um, and so um, six out of 10 patients were able to restore the surface of their eye and 80% um, of them gained improved vision. Now, um, we went on to win the uh, Young Inventors on the ABC, um, the People's Choice of New Inventors, who we were young at the time, but they were new inventors, the People's Choice Award um, and the episode winners. Now, um, but we still had four out of 10 patients that weren't successful. So the next step was to use animal models. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Giugialamo um, developed this very nice mouse model in which each of these colored streaks is actually a clone of cells, a clone of cells arising from the stem cells. So the limbal stem cells that sit at the edge of the conjunctiva and cornea, when they divide, the clone or that they produce or the clones they produce actually move on to the central cornea in a whirl-like pattern. And this is the pattern that you can see here. And we're able to use this technique to look at what happens in the normal development of mice and their, uh, and their corneal epithelium. And you can see the streaks here originally starting at the limbus and then moving out across the cornea but also to examine what happens in a model of limbal stem cell deficiency. So in mice, we can induce limbal stem cell deficiency, and then we can then graph them with stem cells. Uh, and one way we've done this is with fibrin to try to see if we could find another substrate. But we found that not all the cells that we were transplanting were actually, uh, actually went onto the cornea, and some didn't actually turn into stem cells. They, they differentiated into goblet cells. And cells were even lost on the eyelid. So it wasn't a very good way of transplanting the cells. We also found that certain factors can support the cells to become more stem-like. And one of these was Victronectin. So now we're putting this knowledge together with uh, in our Kickstarter team from Sydney Nano, and we're looking at new biomaterials to enable us to uh, improve our transplantation technique. So more than six out of 10 patients can be um, transplanted, but also have good long-term outcomes because at the moment, the uh, long-term outcomes from the, such procedures aren't good. Thank you, Sydney. Now, so um, that, that's sort of where we've been going with some of the science, but the problem is it takes years um, for our scientific discoveries often to make it into the clinic. And while patients have been waiting, there's people, patients losing vision from um, stem cell treatments that have not been properly tested and proven. So much so that the New England Journal of Medicine called stem cell medicine the Wild West due to the lack of scientific evidence for some of the treatments um, that are being uh, used on patients. So what we did next is we developed a joint um, statement with the Royal Australian uh, um, and New Zealand College of Ophthalmologists. We produced a, pay, a patient inflammation leaflet and we came up with some top tips to enable patients to navigate um, uh, stem cell medicine so they can choose what treatments um, may or may not work to protect them from visual loss um, from unsafe therapies. Now, stem cell deficiency um, it doesn't affect too many people, but when it does, it's severe. But there's some very common conditions that affect many patients. Now, one of those is dry eye, which is actually the most common reason for patients to see an eye care provider. And in that area, I've been working on clinical trials and also looking at patients um, with other conditions. So we found that patients suffering from breast cancer that were taking a medication called aromatase inhibitors actually suffered with dry eye symptoms. And they didn't realize that it was actually related to their treatment. And so they didn't report it to their oncologist. So with our research, um, we were able to make oncologists and patients aware that their dry eye symptoms might be part of their treatment so they could seek help. Now, Next is the registries project. So our work to date um, was looking at what was happening in the clinics and using data that had already been collected, but we wanted to actually um, get a good uh, perspective database of what was happening in the real world. 
And um, for this, um, I developed the Save Site Keratoconus Registry, which is part of the Fight Corneal Blindness Project, uh, which is connected to the Fight Rental Blindness Project. This is, and this is to collect outcomes data from the real world on what's happening with corneal diseases and their treatment. And we now have about 35,000 patient visits on the keratoconus registry. Um, clinicians can use all the information that goes in from everyday clinical practice on how their patients are going for benchmarking. And when patients see their clinician, they can get a nice output, a graphical output that shows their treatment journey. And clinicians are accredited for CPD, ophthalmology and optometry um, in Australia if they use the registry. And we need this because clinical trials, really, they include sort of the perfect patient, Miss and Mr. Perfect. But the real world is a bit more like this. You have all sorts of patients, and even with our treatments, they do all sorts of things. So this post-market surveillance data from the registry is really valuable in finding out what happens in the real world and what happens with real-world treatments. And today, we've collected this data on real world treatments from multiple countries across Australia and Europe, New Zealand. And we've found that uh, corneal cross-linking in the real world, world is, um, is effective for progressive keratoconus. So when keratoconus gets worse, which is a disease of the cornea that causes the cornea to change shape, and patients can expect improved vision, a stabilization of their corneal shape. And this is sustained at up to five years after treatment. We During um, COVID, we found with the registry, there was a reduction in data going in, a reduction in patients being seen, and we're able to alert um, patients that there is, um, there is a need to see your ophthalmologist uh, to monitor for progression of, of keratoconus because this can be managed with cross-linking. We found there were a few late side effects with cross-linking as well, and that with the procedure, there's now a number of ways it can be done. And we've been able to look at the range of treatments available and inform patients. But again, to get the um, our research findings out of um, the scientific journals and to patients, we developed a brochure that explained to patients what happened in the cross-linking procedure. The procedure can be very painful, unfortunately. And, and so this brochure was able to provide them some reassurance about you know, what was the right, uh, what was the correct techniques to be looking for when your clinician was um, offering cross-linking and um, what, what was going to happen to them during their treatment journey. And this was produced in association with Keratoconus Australia. Now, um, another area of concern for the cornea is infection. And this is because there's a large variety of microbes that can infect the cornea. And when this happens to an elderly patient, they have a 10% chance of losing the eye. That's quite high and 40% will lose vision. And for children, because of the scarring after infection, they actually end, can end up with lifelong amblyopia, which is lazy eye. So they never will develop the vision in that eye. So for my research on improving outcomes from microbial keratitis, um, we partnered with microbiologists and we found out that we needed to improve the ways we could identify the bacteria that were isolated. We needed to improve our treatment regimes and we needed to know what um, bugs were resistant. And then lastly, we need to educate the public and the patients and so they could benefit from our research findings. Um, we did a research project asking the patients what they thought of um, micro having a keratitis, a corneal infection, and its treatment, because the treatment at the moment is giving patients eye drops every hour around the clock, 24-7. And so one patient said how tired that they'd been, they thought they could sleep on a barbed wire fence. So um, we need better treatments. Another uh, common cause of corneal blindness in developed nations is herpes simplex keratitis. And one of my recent PhD students, Dr. Maria Crabrier-Argos, did um, looked extensively into this to try to find solutions to improve outcomes here in Australia. And what we found when we looked at prescribing patterns for clinicians for this condition 
is that most of them didn't actually meet the recommendations from the literature. Um, so there's different types of this infection and it can affect different parts of the cornea. Uh, and only half in half of the cases was it being treated with um, recommended therapies. So we developed guidelines and these have been distributed on a little lanyard card that the doctors wear around the hospital, on the website um, in, in, and in apps. Now, uh, trauma can also uh, cause uh, corneal blindness. It's in fact the second most common cause of corneal blindness and in developing countries is a silent epidemic. Now, 90% of blindness from trauma is ocular trauma is actually um, preventable. And so I've been working um, as a chief investigator on the International Globe and Nexel Trauma Epidemiological Study, which we call iGATES. And this has been collecting data again from around the globe to find policies and, and develop advocacy to prevent vision loss from trauma. And Annette Hoskins is my PhD student who has been working on this. Now, lastly, it's not only uh, infection, trauma, uh, and degenerative disease that can affect the cornea, it's also diet. And um, we found that children in Australia were actually suffering from vitamin A deficiency. Now, this is a condition you normally see in the developed world, developing world in association with measles. So it's quite unusual to see it in Australia because it's associated with malnutrition. But what we found is that children suffering from this condition had a particular diet just of chips and coke. Um, I also reported an adult with the same condition. Uh, and this, uh, our research work on this condition was picked up by the Herald, social media, and we ended up having a co combined reach of over 800 um, uh, in the media in relation to this story. And it was actually included in a, in a documentary um, on vitamins called Vitamania, which is actually very good. But look, all this you can't achieve alone. You need to do through collaborations. And we've been collaborating the Cornell Research Group across the university, across Australia and internationally. Um, I'm also chair currently of Australian Vision Research. Uh, and there we provide funding for eye research with the point of developing new knowledge to improve practice and patient care. But most importantly, I think what we need to do into the future and for tomorrow is train the next generation of experts to take things forward. To date, I've trained, trained um, a number of PhD students, um, fellows, masters, honours, and continuing to train the next generation because they'll take our discoveries now and make them the treatments of the future. So tomorrow, if you want to find out more, stay in touch. I'm on Twitter. Um, Instagram rarely, <laughs> and uh, and keep in touch with Australian Vision Research also on, on Twitter. Um, and uh, thank you for the congratulations around the honour, though. It was, it was quite a nice surprise. But while we all sit here and listen, patients continue to go blind from corneal blindness, and 70% of patients currently prefer to lose a limb or die 10 years earlier than go blind. And so we need new treatments. We need innovation in for tomorrow to find our new therapies. But once we find our therapies and with our existing therapies, we need to both evaluate and improve practice. We need to bring, we need to build partnerships. And a lot of my work couldn't have occurred without partnerships amongst scientists and with scientists. And we also then need to change policies. And through changing policies, we can transform many lives as well. So this is a little quote at the end. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. So I think being a clinician scientist, you also have to keep, probably like a scientist as well, just keep trying and keep moving forward and doing your best. Uh, there's uh, been a large number of people that have supported me over my over the years and also um, some fantastic uh, postdocs and PhD students um, as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Himmel Candle also, he's my current postdoc and he's been doing an exceptional work on the registry. Thank you. So I'll stop the share. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was just amazing. It's, um, it's so incredible. You mentioned all these different achievements uh, so humbly and easily. 
that someone from outside this academia space, they wouldn't really believe how much effort and hard work has um, gone into this um, whole um, kind of um, overall achievement that you've got. So I think um, we would really like to ask a um, few questions. And uh, I, I would like to start with some questions around how to build identity um, as independent researchers at early stages of career. I think we do have quite um, a lot of um, early career researchers. And uh, I think we are all very much keen to hear from you from that early stage, how you can just achieve these, um, this kind of um, identity and visibility. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think it's finding uh, good people to work with, um, having uh, having a plan, whether that be a sort of a two-year plan or a five-year plan, um, and then constantly re-evaluating what you're doing to make sure, you know, what you're doing is having impact. Uh, and then whenever you, you know, whenever you sort of do a piece of work, uh, think of where else that work can go. So if it's a scientific paper, um, or, or if say if you give a lecture, that lecture can easily be written into a scientific paper. And then does that scientific paper have any value for the public or the patients or you know the world at large? And then how to how to make that relevant as well? Um, and so that way you you can translate your findings, uh, even if it's not into a new therapy, it's into a, into knowledge that's useful for the community. Absolutely. I think someone mentioned um, in the text message that um, engagement with consumers is very important. And I could see in every step um, that you described, you have a really strong connection with consumers of your research, um, a lot of uh, guidelines for them, a lot of um, kind of communications um, engagements with the consumers. So I think you're a, a clinician scientist and I think um, you're much, much closer to that type of, um, to, to achieve that engagement. Um, how would you think basic researchers can get to that front line and uh, get engaged with the consumers of their research? Yes, I mean, there, there aren't nowadays for, um, various patient consumer groups forming. And so one group that I work with is Keratoconus Australia. And so if you can find a pre-formed consumer group um, already and reach out to them, often they're very excited to hear from people that are actually interested in their condition. Um, and, you know, and it's been very useful, including, and then you can include them in, if you've got a research project and, you know, ask their opinion. Uh, and, and often it provides, you know, a good insight into what the patient might be suffering with or what the or what a need is that you may not have considered. Um, these days, a lot of grant applications also requiring patient groups to be on them. Uh, and so if you can identify that group and work with them, I found generally they're, they're more than happy to be, um, uh, to, you know, to be included. Uh, it can be harder if you're looking for, you know, individual patients, and then you'd have to go through a clinician um, most probably to find them unless it's someone you've met socially. But uh, and the other avenue is through the colleges um, like RANSCO. Work, I've been working with them and they're quite interested in the guidelines. So if we do develop a guideline, generally we look and see whether, um, I mean, initially when we were doing it, RANSCO didn't have any policies on guidelines and now they've got a, a policy around how you develop guidelines. So if you're looking to develop a guideline for whatever area you could contact the body, that, that would find that guideline the most useful and see if they've got um, somebody to work, you know, somebody might work with you on it. I think these are really important tips. Um, I know that, for example, for breast cancer, we have Breast Cancer Australia and um, you can have um, consumer representatives on your research. Um, the only thing is that it's very much valuable. The only thing is that... Uh, it's just one person who is uh, engaged with your research rather than like having, uh, as you men mentioned, the, the, the college um, kind of um, th that sort of avenue perhaps could be, uh, could give you a wider um, kind of um, idea of what, what you can get from consumers. That would be very helpful. Um, 
Anyone has uh, questions for Stephanie? I, I do, Pika. Fantastic, Stephanie. I'm always impressed by the simple fact that you multitask so well because on the one hand, you are a clinician and you are treating patients and you're operating and you're still part of a university and you're engaged in a department and you're engaged with City Nano. And I would be interested just to hear how you do manage those different priorities and how it sort of works on a sort of weekly basis. How much of your time is with clinicians? How much of your time is in the lab? How much of your time is with the university? Yeah, so, I mean, how, how you manage it, it's generally a lot of days can be a bit chaotic. chaotic. And so as an example, um, this morning I had an operating list, but I also had a meeting. But then the night before I get a call to say, oh, well, now you, your list has to start later because of some other reason. And then uh, I'm thinking, oh, that's good. I've now got this, you know, I've now got the time clear for the meeting. And then they ring back, oh, no, now the list is back on. We're moving it forward. <laughs> and then this morning I get another call. Oh, the last patient on the list is now being cancelled. And so then that then opened up additional time. And then the, during the list, one of the fellows I've been training was leaving for overseas. So she bought a cake. So we had to stop the cake. <laughs> which then delayed the list. And so, I mean, you have to be very agile. I mean, things are constantly changing because with patient care, there, there can be things that come up that you can't predict. And I mean, you, you're working in systems such as public hospital system where you, you, you're not always in charge of the timing. But that's on a daily basis. But in terms of the average week, that you are in, you are in charge more of what you do. And so if I know... Um, I've got meetings and things and there's enough warning. Generally, I can clear my schedule because I do kind of work for myself as well as doing work for the university. And there's a lot more flexibility in now how you do that. So it's not really a, on a single week. It won't be like um, it won't be consistent. It'll be varying each week. And that's according to the needs of what needs to be done. I've just put in a development grant and um and so that, you know, required a lot of extra work. So I've done a lot of extra sort of university work in the last week um, than normal. And then conferences used to be great for getting a lot of work done, but there's less of those <laughs> and need to start going to some more. So I bet that can't happen without having a really um, great um, planning and management skill. <laughs> So um, I have a question. Um, we we know that a lot of discoveries fail um, before they they are commercialized and fully translated into the clinic, and a lot of the times in different clinical stages. Um, very disappointingly, sometimes at phase three. Um, so I would like to actually ask a question whether. We can associate some of these failures to not have um, not having enough collaborations between clinicians and basic scientists. So, obviously, researchers are looking to into translating their findings into clinical settings, and they typically call, want to collaborate with clinician scientists. And of course, uh, those collaborations will assist in identifying unmet needs um, for patients and unmet clinical um, needs and challenges. Uh, but how can that happen? How can uh, researchers um, get access to clinicians? How can they um, make what they work on appealing to clinicians? So they, uh, like among all that kind of busy schedule that they have, they can accommodate um, like one new project, one new um, thing to work on. Yeah. So I think, I think yes, things don't uh, always succeed in the commercial sense, you know, through unmet needs, but also through a lack of being able to pivot and change. Uh, and so some people embark on a, a certain project and they then want to continue down that idea even after things, you know, come up, which means they should have really pivoted and changed in some way. And one of the things that, that is obvious is fulfilling a, a need that's unmet. And so it's really understanding that unmet need. And it can be difficult to find clinicians to work with. I mean, there are now sort of seminars that are happening between the area health services and the university. 
Uh, and so that's always a good starting point to go along to those and see if anyone there is talking in an area that is relevant to what you're working in. You can also, you know, use online resources to find people that might be relevant to you. And sometimes, you know, it can also vary in seniority. Sometimes you might find someone that's not a senior that's got more time or you might find a, a very senior person that's got time. So it's not always the rule, but don't don't sort of just stick at asking the professor if you're not um, uh, getting enough traction sometimes, you know, or maybe the professor can introduce you with someone and, and the two postdocs can talk and work together. Um, so it, it's, it, I mean, most of the, the scientists that I've met have sort of been through, uh, you know, going to, um, turning up to uh, um, sort of meetings, uh, smaller meetings, where there's more chance for opportunity and and uh, and conversation, and then seeing if somebody's interested in in what you're doing. And most people, when you approach them, generally are pretty interested. The other thing is, if you email a clinician and they don't get back, just email again. Um, or, or you know, if you can find a time when they're talking somewhere and you can go along and, and meet with them. Uh, but it, it is it is tricky. But I think if the if you're you know. It, there's also I found over the years that there's various collaborations that you can start, um, but not all collaborations will actually be successful long term. And so usually when I start a collaboration or, you know, we start with something small and see if it's achievable, like can we all write a systemic a systematic review together? You know, if we if we can't even do that in a timely manner, then it's probably not going to be a worthwhile collaboration uh, in the long term. So I think as well as making collaborations, it's also assessing the collaborations as you go along um, to, because each of us only have a certain amount of time and so you have to decide to spend time on the things that are going to add value to what you're doing. I mean, some things you do when you're more junior to build your CV and get experience, but you have to make sure things kind of line up together so they're heading in the same direction. Otherwise, you can't focus on those and part of that is sort of reassessing any collaborations and and um, making sure they're achievable because sometimes you can also have great chats with people about what you might do, but unless you actually can start doing it and do it, then it won't end up anywhere and you'll spend time. Yeah, these are excellent tips. Thank you so much, Stephanie. We have a question from Jed. Um, uh, he's thanking you and also asking, have you worked with regulators like the TGA or FDA on the stem cell project? And what is the path to market a clinic for a product like that? Yeah, so what we what I did, I got some funding from the Medical Researchers Futures Fund and um, I engaged um, BioIntellect. They're a, a, a company that looks um, at the path to market regulation uh, and they they working with them. We produced a report which um, laid out our path to market and what regulatory uh, uh, what regulatory requirements we'd probably have in taking the the stem cell treatment to market. So we have a very clear pathway for stem cells. Some of the regulation is still being sorted and still being worked out. So the TGA is not um, uh, not fully uh, not they don't have fully developed pathways, and so part of that is an engagement. So generally, when you're developing a device you should um you should have conversations with the tga or you need to get somebody who who's an expert in regulatory advice um it's tricky uh, i mean you can do it by paying for it the other way to do it is to go through courses such as um that are run by organizations including cicada that will put you in touch with um, potential regulatory advisors and they'll give you a little bit of initial advice for free but one, if you're going to go down sort of the startup route then one of the things you end up needing to spend money on is actually regulatory advice um yeah thank you so much um I, I have a question regarding like how to frame um research a lot of the times researchers use a lot of jargons and yeah. and they they we are just so much used to like um speak in like technical terms and it can be very difficult for some people to incorporate and engage with end users and even with clinicians like um and vice versa like clinicians with basic researchers 
we may not know their language and basic researchers may not know clinicians' language. Sometimes it happens to me, even though I have some clinical background as clinical pharmacist, I know that um, there are some terms that we use in basic science that can be used differently or interpreted differently in, in the clinic and in, in practice. So what are your, um, ad, uh, what's your advice to researchers to first um, connect with clinicians and also to end users, um, like consumers, et cetera? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we developed some um, information leaflets for pan- um, information leaflets for patients with the hospital and we had some advice from the health literacy um, officer there and she said look for health literacy the average the age that you want to um, aim your material at is actually eight years old <laughs> something like that so it's actually it's actually a real so if you think about that when you're writing anything that you're actually probably writing for a 10 year old um you know or an eight year old even if you're writing for the general public it's got to be and even when I do you know write something that I think is good for the general public if you give it to a health literacy person I'll still probably make changes um so it has to be like really very simple and you 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 know often also you can show whatever you've written to somebody completely outside your area and that's a good idea for these things like investigator grants um because they may they're going to get judged by people that aren't experts in your area uh, and so it does need to be, you know, it does need to be quite simple. I noticed in one of your, um, I think that was a leaflet or some uh, like guideline sort of thing for consumers that you mentioned, what is stem cell? Yeah, um, yeah. So I think sometimes it's inevitable and you really can't avoid uh, using those terms because the whole technology is based on those terms. And I, I really like the way that you would open it up first, what is stem cell? And because your technology is, of course, based on that um, thing. And if someone doesn't know what stem cell is, and you can't avoid using it, you can't use another yeah. term. So that, well, they'll be wrong. I really like that. I think that's uh, perhaps another way to introduce it in very simple language. And then, then from that point on, it will not be a jargon for that 10-year-old or 8-year-old. Um, yeah. One of the good analogies I like for stem cells, and I've got some good slides, is like Lego, that the stem cells are really the building blocks um, of, you know, of the body. And I've, I've got some good pictures of sort of good Lego that's gone right and wrong. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so sometimes really I good, think yeah. analogies are very valuable as well when talking to um, patients, consumers, and other, even other scientists or clinicians. Um, everyone's very time pressed these days, and so if you can take a complex thing and make an analogy so often when I'm giving a talk I'll spend some time I'll have a theme where I'll you know maybe do oh I did a David Bowie talk once (laughs) where I managed to have it was on stem cells and uh, I managed to have sort of a slide or a theme around you know some some of his great songs with some concepts that um, to understand about stem cells Uh, so to make it um, make it more um, packageable and interesting well, wow, that that's that's very helpful. Uh, I think yeah. Mark has um, a question or comment. Yeah, I had my hand raised, but I wasn't sure you could see it on the the background. Um, so, yeah, one of the other aspects that I find quite impressive about the uh, presentation is your international experience. Um, so, I have two questions around that. One is about how can researchers strengthen their international experience, uh, international collaborations, because you had mentioned a bit about collaborations. But then the second one is, I was really surprised by that fact that Australia has very low, um, or it has cases of vitamin A deficiency. Mm. Um, I find that really surprising um, and enlightening. So I'm just wondering, are there, and I understand that it's to do with the poor diet, but I'm wondering, are there, um, cases that you've learned along your international travels that we could start to adapt in Australia that could strengthen our healthcare system here. And it might not be in, you know, um, nutrition wise, but it could be in other aspects. So just wanting to glean some of your international travel knowledge. Yeah, I guess what, I've, what I, at the moment, I'm the chair of Arvo's Advocacy and Outreach Committee. And Arvo is the largest and, and most respected eye research organization in the world. And as part of that, um, every year we advocate to Capitol Hill. Uh, and so we talk to Congress people in the US uh, and we advocate for them to give more funding for eye research. And, you know, we ask for a huge amount of money um, 
but that they do give more money to eye research and the National Institute of Health over there. So it's for the National Eye Institute. And there, there's an organisation, Neighbour and Ever, and they put together the information that helps us advocate, so information about why the eye research funding is needed, um, you know, the cost of not funding research. And, and so, and they, um, you know, they publish papers on that. So I think I think they do a better job in the US at advocating for money for research from government. And part of that is having, uh, you know, good information, but then also setting up regular, something regular. So every year there's this particular day when we all, you know, all the eye researchers go up to Capitol Hill. Now it's virtual uh, and, and put the case forward. Uh, so I think being, uh, I think some countries are a bit more organised in terms of advocacy. I think the UK is very well organised in terms of evidence-based medicine, and there's lots of opportunities there to pursue evidence-based medicine. Uh, and um, I mean, and, and there's lots of interesting opportunities arising in Asia and, and other parts of the globe and Europe. Uh, I think to get involved internationally. Um, for example, Arvo has a range of committees and every year they put out an ad, say, who wants to go on the committees? And I used to look at those ads and think, oh, well, you know, what they're probably looking for other people, like somebody else they already know. Uh, and then one year I decide to apply for them and then they're actually, it actually is a process where they are looking for people and they're taking on people. And, and so I've encouraged um, my postdocs and PhD students to apply for these committees because once you get on one committee, you meet a whole bunch of people and then, then you're eligible for the next committee. Uh, and it's a good way of sort of getting to know people internationally. It then means you go to the conference where, again, you can meet people. And, and this particular conference has a large poster section where the researchers stand by their poster and you can go up and talk to whoever you want in the world in, in whatever area of research. So try to be engaged and um, find opportunities to, to make uh, connections. Yeah, fantastic. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Ben, please. Yeah, yeah great discussion. I was just uh, thinking about some closing comments, and it's interesting from Sydney Nano's point of view because we started off as an institute anchored in the physical sciences and adjacent to the School of Physics, and of course, what has emerged over the last three to four years as we engaged across the university ecosystem and engaged externally is that the kind of real action, the real translational and transformational impact is in the life sciences and nanohealth health and nanomedicine medicine has emerged as a, a major flagship for our research enterprise at the University of Sydney and I think globally. Um, I think we're only at the beginning and just reflecting on your earlier comments, my experience um, as we formulated the Nana Health Network and PIGA was part of those conversations when we would engage clinicians, there was an enormous appetite and enthusiasm from the clinicians that we spoke to. Um, I'm thinking of conversations at RPA, at uh, North Shore, at the Colding Institute, at Westmead, at Save Site. We always are well received. There's an enormous appetite. There's enormous enthusiasm. And it feels like we're only scratching the surface in terms of mm. the art of the possible and, and and the challenges, which I think was alluded to earlier. How to because you're all so busy, you're out there at the coal face. I always think of you collisions. You're doing this serious heavy lifting, you know, you're saving lives, you're restoring eyesight. And I'm very humbled by what you do. And we don't want to distract you. We want to engage you and bring you value. And how do we do that? Because I just think there's so much capacity, there's so much innovation, there's so much tech that's on offer that can transform lives. I mean, do you have any suggestions of how we might do it as an institution, as an institute better? Um, yeah, so I guess we, uh, you know, thinking about collaborations and if it is hard and people are time poor, then local collaborations are often good as ones that are easy to get off the ground. And so we should have a reach out day where we, you know, reach out to, you know, people at RPA or, you know, safe site or, you know, do direct directly try to um, reach out to those groups again uh, in, in uh, you know, in workshops or because it, it is hard. Like if you just put out general messages, then not everyone engages with that. So I think we need to target groups that are able, that are going to be easy for the groups to um, to engage and to meet with. 
Um, I mean, things can be done virtually and everything now, so it doesn't necessarily have to be local, but it is a it is sort of I find it does facilitate engagement and particularly if they want to come on site and look at technologies and things like that. So and it would be easier, you know, and then I think we need to um, look at what grants groups can put in because ultimately it does come down to having some funding. And so if you can have a grant where the the, um, the clinician and the scientist are engaging, you're able to hire a PhD student, then that will really build that collaboration because then you and then you've got the pilot data and you you know you're working together. So if there's no existing funding, then then you have to look at ways to get that funding. Yeah, at the end of the day, but there's something exciting in what you've just said then. I think in terms of how we engage those different, I mean, Sydney, we're in an interesting place because we're surrounded by these massive hospitals and medical precincts. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, how do we engage them? And do we do at a North Shore showcase sort of day? Do we do a Westmead showcase day? Do we do an RPA day? Yeah, how yeah, do we yeah. take our nano health capabilities and engage them in a way that is efficient and brings to life new relationships, new opportunities? new grants, as you say, um, the, but really other, interesting. Yeah, the other thought is, um, you know, like all those places are already having existing meetings like Grand Rounds or, you know, you know whether you can get a five-minute slot in the Grand Rounds or, you know, go, go to them as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good, good stuff. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Ben. That was a very, um, I think, key uh, question for us um, at NanoHealth and also at the um, individual researcher um, level to know how we can uh, engage. So um, I would like to summarize and ask your opinion about um, the way that I'm putting this together at the end of the session and um, just tell me where I, I need to kind of change that um, sort of summary. But I think in the first place, we commence interaction with a um, discussion with a clinician of the issue that faces in the management of their patients in whatever area they're working uh, at. And then next would be learn to use a language that is communicable uh, with both clinicians and um, the scientists. And uh, because I think at that first um, stage of communication, uh, it's on us uh, as researchers um, that learn how to do the, the how to just uh, put together uh, whatever proposal we want to bring in. We cannot reach out to kind of uh, a science communicator or someone like that at this stage. Probably we should learn how to um, kind of um, compose that, that um, piece of discussion and also be very clear about what we want to achieve from that collaboration uh, with clinicians and be very frank about what is it, what is in it for the clinician, right? I think it's quite important that they know how they benefit from that collaboration um, as it proceeds. So I would like to uh, to know your opinion. Is it fair to, to just put together these um, as a summary? And if you want to add anything um, onto that, that would be great. No, that's a, that's an excellent summary. I think that's spot on. Um, the only thing I'd add on is just to recall back to that quote from Helen Keller is about optimism that just, you know, if it doesn't work, just pick yourself up and try again. Apparently most on, uh, entrepreneurs have failed in previous ventures and they, you know, they learn by just doing. So you can learn as much from your failures as you can from your successes. So just keep out there and keep trying. Absolutely. That's a brilliant message to be sent across. And I think also with the collaborations, I think um, there can be failure in collaborations and uh, I think we should just be uh, persistent in trying um, uh, other people, other um, collaborators. If one doesn't work, it doesn't mean that there is something wrong in what we are doing. And I think probably we have to be um, persistent on that. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would like to, if nobody else has any questions, I would like to close the session. Ben, do you want to um, give some closing remarks? Oh, just to thank you, Pega, and thank you, Stephanie. That was brilliant. And we're going to unpack some of those um, 
recommendations and, and follow up, but really uh, look forward to working with you, Stephanie, in the next phase. And thank you again, Vega. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie, for your time and uh, really valuable um, different pieces of advice. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.